Anytime you fire up Google and type in the words Mount Everest, you are greeted with facts of the highest peak in the world, along with some incredible photos from the many success stories ranging back for over 65 years. But there is a darker side of the mountain, one that requires a little more digging, and even though I've covered some amazing stories and heartbreaking tragedies on this channel, there's one story that always seems to pop up. There is one story that, like the mountain itself, is always at the forefront. The most famous tragedy on the most famous mountain in the world. This is the story of Suang Paljor, or as many call him, Green Boots. Hello everyone and welcome to my channel where we cover all tragic and terror stories. So if you enjoy this type of content, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button, plus ring the notification bell to be notified of all new uploads. And as always, viewer discretion is advised. By now, we all know the dangers of Mount Everest. Whether it's the height of the 29,032 foot mountain, the weather conditions, seracs and ice falls, avalanches, lack of oxygen in the death zone, well, you get the idea. If you want to know more about the mountain, I encourage you to watch my other Everest videos, as every story has their own set of challenges that highlight the many dangers of the peak. Every year, climbers from around the world flock to Everest in an attempt to reach the world's highest point. And every year, some of those climbers never make it off the mountain. Some years have very few tragedies, while others have many. Then there are very few years that stand out among the rest. In 1996, a four-man team from India traveled to the base camp of Everest with the intent to climb up the north face of the mountain. One of these men was a 28-year-old Indo-Tibetan border police named Sai Wong Paljor. Paljor, after completing 10th grade, had dropped out of school to help provide for his struggling family, and they were overjoyed when the middle child, who had five siblings, was accepted into the ITBP. The men that serve in the ITBP specialize in high-altitude landscapes, as it was a necessity for India since their border with China stretches across the Himalayas. Paljor stood out as an excellent climber, and it was no surprise that when a secret mission was rolled out, Paljor was an easy candidate. The mission was to summit the world's highest peak from the colder and windier north side of the mountain, becoming the first Indians to ever do so. Paljor would not tell his mother of the mission, but after sharing with some friends, word would reach her. She pleaded with him not to go, but he told her that he had to. He thought if he could summit Everest, it would bring benefits to his family. Thinly, the younger brother of Paljor was a monk, and just days before Paljor left for the mountain, he would join his brother for a prayer. Thinly stated that Paljor was excited while saying goodbye, and above all else he was ready, but Thinly would be the last of his family to see Paljor alive. Paljor would be joined by fellow climbers Subidar Sewang Smanla, Dorje Morup, and Commander Mohinder Singh, who would lead the team. They would fly into Tibet in April 1996 and begin the roughly two-week walk to the base camp of Everest. Travel went smoothly as this was not their first rodeo and the team made it to base camp with relative ease. They had a large tent they all shared. In fact, it was open to all climbers and they would often have other groups stopping by to share a cup of tea, showing the respect and character the ITBP team had. Their goal was the North Call route up the mountain, which would begin with the trip from base camp to advanced base camp at 21,300 feet, then reaching camp 4 on the North Call at roughly 23,100 feet. Then it would be a steep climb up the North Ridge to camp 5 at 25,600 feet, and finally camp 6 at 27,200 feet, or 8,230 meters, which is well within the death zone. The death zone being above 8,000 meters on any mountain, where the oxygen is a third of what it would be at sea level. This typically equates to exerting most of one's energy simply to breathe, much less climb. This is why climbers tend to move slower up the mountain the higher the altitude. And finally, it's important to note the 2 o'clock rule of Everest. It is one of the most serious rules in the mountain and should be followed as if it was part of the 10 commandments of climbing the world's highest peak. It simply means that on summit day, if a climber is unable to reach the summit by 2 p.m., then they should turn around. Reaching the top after 2 p.m. would mean descending in the dark through the death zone, where one wrong step could mean the end. 
Of course, the ITBP knew all these rules plus more when they started their climb in May, and they made quick work the first few days making it all the way to Camp 6 on May 9th. They were already in the death zone, yet all four still felt strong. They were slightly exhausted from the events of the previous weeks, but they were running on adrenaline as they slept just under the summit. Their plan, like most summit days, was to set out from camp at 3.30 a.m. so that they could reach the summit well before 2 p.m. and descend back to Camp 6 before the sun set. The weather had been calm to this point. It was strangely eerie. In fact, it was almost as if it was the calm before the storm. May 9th would be the final day the team could enjoy together. The issues would begin on May 10th as the winds would pick up during the night, meaning it would slow the climbers down in the morning. Then 3.30 a.m. came, but there was no movement at all. Then 4.30, 5.30, and still quiet. The team simply overslept, and combined with the winds, their leader Singh knew that the summit attempt would not be safe on May 10th, as the group did not leave Camp 6 until 8 a.m., which meant if they tried to summit, it would be well past 2 p.m. So instead, he instructed his team that they were going to fix the ropes higher up on the mountain, so that they could attempt a summit tomorrow with less work. So the men set out from camp on their way up towards the three steps of Everest's north face, checking and replacing the rope as they climbed. The three steps are by far the hardest challenge of the death zone. Each step is made up of large rocks and boulders combined with ice, where climbers have to go over or around small pathways to traverse them. At a normal altitude, any fit climber can make quick work of the steps, but in the death zone, everything is slower and the lack of oxygen makes it difficult to traverse them. By 2.30 in the afternoon, the team had made significant progress, but Singh knew that it was time to turn around no matter where they were on the mountain. The winds had picked up even more and raged around the four men, yet Singh had fallen behind the other three climbers, and when he signaled for their attention to turn around, they didn't listen. To this day, Singh doesn't know if they ignored him or simply did not see him, but the frostbitten leader had no choice as he knew he could not survive a night without shelter, so he turned around and started making his way back to Camp 6 by himself. It was 30 minutes later at 3 p.m. that Singh heard the walkie sputter to life. He quickly grabbed it as he was grasping for any news. The last 30 minutes of climbing had been hell. He listened and heard Smanla's voice over the walkie. Sir, we are heading towards the summit. Singh practically screamed through the walkie. Oh no, the weather is very deceptive, bad. Smanla was confident though and all three climbers felt fit. There was no changing their minds. Don't be overconfident, listen to me. Please come down, the sun is going to set. Singh was pleading with them, but that's when Paljor came on the phone and stated, Sir, please allow us to go up. You could hear the pride in his voice as they knew they were only an hour away from the summit. Then before Singh could respond, he heard the sharp click of the call ending and his heart sank. Singh believed his team was suffering from summit fever, which is a psychological feeling when climbing. When a climber gets closer and closer to the summit, they begin to lose the sense of danger that comes with overexerting oneself, instead focusing on the only goal of reaching the top, ignoring that one must save energy to descend the mountain. It wasn't until 5.35 p.m. that Singh heard back from his team. Smanla came on the radio and announced that he, Paljor, and Morup were standing on the summit. Singh was overjoyed, but still urged the men to begin their descent as quickly as possible. But even as he spoke with them, he couldn't help but feel pride, and was excited to relay the message to base camp and their country. Celebration would begin both at camp and home as news traveled fast. They had made history. It would be wrong for me not to mention that there is some controversy around their summit, as some suspect the men unintentionally stopped 150 meters short of the summit due to bad weather and the mental fog of being at such a high altitude. Even so, they are credited with the summit. Celebrations would continue at home, but at camp they would abruptly end as the weather that had gotten increasingly worse over the day had turned into a full-blown storm from hell. Today we know the evening of May 10, 1996 as a terrible blizzard in Everest's history, and at the time those on the mountain certainly felt the impact. Singh in desperation knew that he could not help, but he did ask a Japanese commercial team to help as two of the climbers planned to leave for the summit that morning. A Sherpa had to translate for Singh, but he urged the leader to let his team know of the situation, and the Japanese leader let Singh know that they would do all they could if they passed the climbers on their way to the summit. There is controversy around what happened next, so please do your own research before reaching any conclusion. 
But on the morning of May 11th, the weather finally eased and the two Japanese climbers set out for the summit. Around 9 a.m., the leader of the team informed Singh that the two climbers had come across Mora, who was frostbitten and laying in the snow alone, but still alive. They had helped him clip into the fixed line, but then continued on with their summit push. Roughly two hours later, they passed Manla and Paljor, but did not stop to render any help as the sky was clear and the Japanese climbers did not feel the two climbers were in need of any help, so they continued forward. While it is well known that above 8,000 meters, it is nearly impossible to help an incapacitated climber, Singh could not help but feel betrayed, and would later state, the black tea that the Japanese served us tasted black indeed. Additionally, it was later released that the two Japanese climbers had never been notified of any other climbers that were in trouble and may need their assistance. To this day, this is still a hot debate around mountaineering ethics. Paljor's final moments were spent alone as he had made his way into a small cave at the first step still in the death zone. He would huddle in the cave with his gear behind him and succumb to the elements of Everest. His body would become a trail marker for years as it was too cold for him to decompose and climbers who had traversed the mountain from the north side would have to step over the famous green boots. It is important to note that like all stories, there is controversy, and that has not escaped this one as alluded to earlier. But there is also some debate on whether Green Boots was Paljor or actually his teammate Morup. The general consensus is that it is Paljor, but there are some who question this. Paljor would be alone for over 20 years, until he was joined by another climber who would tragically lose his life in the same cave, after being passed by several groups further increasing the notoriety of the landmark. In 2014, climbers would report that Green Boots or Paljor had gone missing, as they could no longer see him when passing the first step. He would not be seen again until 2017 when he was spotted, but mostly covered by snow and rocks, and to this day, he remains covered out of respect. ITBP would pay Paljor's mother, Tashi Angmo, a one-time payment of $3,690, along with a $36 a month pension. In today's dollars, this would equate to roughly $7,200, a measly amount when compared to losing a son. This story is a landmark in Everest's history, and is an important lesson as to why being blinded by glory is just another risk of the mountain. Just because you can reach the top, doesn't always mean you should.